first people. Chapter 1, beginning at verse 3. And I'm going to be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. And as is custom in this branch of time, I'm going to ask that you would stand to your feet if you are able at the reading of God's holy word. 1 Peter chapter 1, you've heard it partially read by Mr. Hawks, verses 13 through 16. I want to take you back, give you a little context, give you a little understanding of what's happening in this particular text. 1 Peter chapter 1. Beginning at verse 3, reading to 16. And it reads as such. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And into an inheritance that is imperishable undefined and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you, in this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith being more precious than gold that through perishable is tested by fire may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him yet, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving, for you are receiving, for you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that was to be yours made careful search and inquiry, inquiring about the person or time that the Spirit of Christ within them indicated when it testified in advance to the sufferings destined for Christ and the subsequent glory. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, the prophets, they were serving not themselves, but you, in regard to the things that have now been announced to you through those who brought you good news by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, yeah. things into which angels long to look. Yeah. 13. Therefore, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Discipline yourselves. Set all your hope on the grace that Jesus Christ will bring you when he is revealed. Like obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires that you formerly had in it. Instead, as he who called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all your conduct. For it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. You may be seated at the reading of God's holy word need you to pray with me on this one. I want to talk to you from the subject, when the empire strikes back. When the empire strikes back. Would you bow and would you pray with me just now, gracious and eternal God? We say thank you. We give you the praise, we give you the glory, and we give you all of the honor. We recognize, God, that we are a feeble people. God, that we need you, Father God, to bolster us up and strengthen us on every side. 
God, we love you. And we thank you, God, for this opportunity once again to, to be here in this service of worship here at Moses. God, I pray, Lord, that as you have blessed us up to this point, God, I pray, Lord, that you would bless your servant. That you would bless, Father God, in such a way that the words that fall from your servant's mouth may fall on ground that is firm. God, may those words take deep root in the hearts of men, women, boys, and girls. And then sprout up to be the beautiful flower that you so desire. God, we're grateful. Grateful for your presence. Grateful for this opportunity. Bless us now. And God, let us not forget your Holy Spirit yes. that strengthens us and gives us direction and helps to transform us. Yes. God, you continue to do what you're doing in this place. Yes. And God, we will give you the glory for all that you do, all that you are. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. When the empire strikes back, therefore prepare your minds for action. Discipline yourself, set all your hope on the grace that Jesus will bring you when he is revealed. Like obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires that you formerly had in ignorance. Instead, as he has called you to be holy, as he called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all your conduct, in all the things that you do, every place that you step, everywhere that you go, everything that you speak. For it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Mosby. As we have been traveling in 2015, and as we begin to redefine our footprint on the corner of 2901 Mechanicsville Turnpike, bordering on the county of Enrico in the city of Richmond, in the state of Virginia, across this country and in the world, it should be said that before we go anywhere, before we do anything, before we make any kind of move, we need to begin at home first. It should be duly noted by any member within any congregation that serves the Lord that to spread the good news, you ought to be right in your own house. The world we live in is now one that is surrounded by nefarious activities. That is, the kind of activities that we see from day to day are extremely wicked and criminal. In many ways, this world is unforgiving in the way it carries out its laws and organize its own systems. Before you go anywhere proclaiming what saith the Lord, it is important that we understand what God is doing in our own front yard. For many of you, you know what is happening in and on the streets and on and in your own communities. For you could write your own script. All you would need to do is pull out a pen and pen and pad and, and go ahead and look out your window and see what is happening. And these systems that we see from day to day, the political, the legal, the financial, the educational, social, and religious, they come and go. They rise and they fall. They ebb and they flow. Even though one system fails, I can guarantee that there will be another one that rears its ugly head. Yes. Just this week, a uh, system failed. A system failed in South Carolina. The South Carolina legislature determined that it was unconstitutional to fly the Confederate flag on the state house grounds. An empire has come down. But even though this empire has come down, there will be another empire that raises on us. I say this because when you mess with the social and financial infrastructure within a deep-rooted system, you begin to mess with fire. Don't mess with nobody's money. Don't mess with the way people live. Don't mess with the way that they do things. People don't like you attempting to alter their existing structures of existence. The structures that have kept people's lives easy and predictable throughout ages. In other words, leave my house alone because we've been doing it well for the past 400 years. And I don't need you to come in and try to take down what I begin to believe or what I have believed in for all this time. Bringing down the Confederate flag is just a few roots within a complicated network of the root system located within the empire. Empires are difficult to bring down, and it is only with conscientious efforts by all that will conquer and move people to where 
God desires them to be. We need people that are willing to tackle the more difficult issues that are raised beyond taking the flag down. The question becomes, and, and James Robinson Jr. stated it well on his Facebook page, and I quote, how do you legislate removing the flags that still hang in the living rooms and the hearts are far too many in this country? I can remove the flag all day long, but if there is no plan to begin furthering the healing in this country, then it will be difficult for this country to remove the hatred that harbors against those particular individuals and groups. I can take it down, but what do we do with those individuals who are still flying it on their truck, trucks, still putting it on their bumpers, still buying and doing what uh, what they think God has them to do. And here in this text is an empire that seeks to bring down a particular group of people. The people in question are the Jewish folk who have converted from Judaism to Christianity. And because of this, they have fled from their Roman Empire into secluded parts of the country. They are exiles, if you will. An exile is a person that has been removed from their native land and caused to live in a foreign country. So here we have a people that can no longer live in their native land because of their faith, because of what they believe in. Peter, the author of this letter, writes to encourage these fellow Christians experiencing continued suffering for their beliefs in a Savior named Jesus the Christ. They believe in Jesus. They once believed in the Jewish customs, but now they understand that now Jesus comes and is the Messiah that was prophesied to come, and we believe him. And so because they believe, because they walk with God, because they believe in Jesus, they are secluded and relegated to different parts of the country outside of where they don't live. Does that sound familiar? The author of this letter writes to encourage his fellow Christians experiencing continued suffering for their beliefs in the Savior named Jesus the Christ. It is at this time that the Emperor Nero was ruling with a very heavy hand. Yeah. Nero in his sixth, and he, he, Nero is the sixth of twelve rulers that is found to be in Rome. Nero is one of the most brutal dictators of all time. Just when you thought things were going to get better in your situation, a Nero-like type of person enters into your world and makes things a little bit difficult. And you begin to wonder whether or not this thing that we do, this thing, this faith thing, walking with God, doing what God has called us to do, ah, you begin to wonder whether or not I can face the Neros in my life. And it is under Nero's rule that he institutes the beginning of Rome's official persecution of the church. But look at the dynamics swirling around in the text. Yeah. Got to look at the context. Not only are the Jewish Christians being persecuted by Roman Emperor, by the Roman Emperor Nero, but they are also being persecuted by the Jews. They are also being persecuted by their own families. Yeah. Hmm. All of these Jewish Christians would likely be misunderstood. Some would be harassed and a few would be even tortured and even killed. Three entities. Roman Jews and their families. And let me pause right there and say this. This text helps us to see that empires are not just on the outside, but empires can be erected right here in the church too. When my family starts messing with me and, and doing things to me, ah, I begin to see and understand that there are empires that are erected in the church and continue to keep me down. I ain't even got outside of the church yet, but there are folks and there are people and there are things, there are ideologies, there are structures, you all can hear me, that continue to dismay us, continue to derail us, and go in a different direction. Look at the breakdown of all three empires. The Romans didn't like them, the Jewish Christians, because they failed to follow and obey the emperor's laws. Jews didn't like them because it made them look bad in front of other fellow Jews. Case in point, won't he do it? Paul and Silas thrown in prison because they messed up with the money and messed with the money of the Jewish owners of the slave girl that they set free. People don't like you messing with their structures and with their stock. And when you come into their house, when you begin to change things, people will try to derail you. 
persecuted them, but also their own families yes. hated on them too. You see, under Roman law, the head of the household had absolute authority of all of its members. The understanding of the, the, the head of the household was that the male was the head of the household. No one else. The male was the head of the household. Unless the ruling male became a Christian, the wife, the children, and all the servants who were believers might well face extreme hardship. And someone needs to hear this. When you serve the Lord, your own family might be placed in jeopardy. And there may be some things that you have to sacrifice, even in your own home, to do what God desires you to do. Things ain't always going to be easy for you when you convert your way over to Jesus the Christ and to continue to follow in his ways. Not only can it place your family in jeopardy, but your family may turn against you in the process of being converted. Do I have anybody in here that is following, following Jesus that sometimes has some difficult situations in their lives because you're trying to get up and get ready to go to church and in the morning time your spouse, your loved one, all the other ones are just laying around and don't have any authority because what? Come on now. There is one that decides they don't want to get up and do what they know needs to be done for their family. You finding the Lord is a good thing. But there are moments that you might find heartache at your own front door. Let me dig a little deep. We see here that men hmm, were the head of their households. And if they didn't believe, they were, there were repercussions on the rest of the family if they did not believe in this man called Jesus Christ. Can I tell you something? It's the same today as it was then. Men, we have a very important and unique role in our homes. Men, when we don't serve the Lord, it changes the entire dynamics of our families. When we decide to get up and do what God has called us to do, then our families will follow along. People wonder why men don't come to church, why men don't come down, why men don't join, why men don't do this. Why, why, why? We need to understand that as men, nobody makes you. Your woman don't make you. Your child don't make you. Society don't make you. God made you. So we need to stand up and be the man that God has called us to be. You all don't hear me. Men need to get involved more. Men need to hit the door more. Men, I know you're working, but sometimes you need to get up and go to church and be an example for the rest of the community. When we choose to follow in the world's way of manhood rather than God's, things will shift downward. But when you make that radical move to step out there on faith and serve God, your life will change. So your family could be the empire that you fight against. Human nature is funny like that. Some folks feel that their power rests in the ability to control others. And the minute they lose that control is the minute they begin to turn up the heat in your life. The minute that you begin to, 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 to they begin to lose control, that's the minute that they begin to say, oh, something has shifted. And I've got to do something in order to make you stay beneath my thumb. The text is clear. When these Christians don't do what we command them to do, when they don't obey the law, when they cease to be the person created by God, and now the problem is with the empire. The empire may come and they may strike back. In other words, when you mess with empire, when you're doing things that are against the laws of society, then you begin to mess with the program. And when you mess with the program, you're fine. you might find yourself in a very heated situation. Yes. Allow me to let you in on a little secret. The Bible says that who the Son has set free is free indeed. When Christ enters the equation, 
I'm free regardless of what you say or what you do to me. You can beat me, you can talk about me, but you can't touch my soul. And I won't be brought, I won't be brought, I won't be brought, and I will not compromise for my convictions. I believe what I believe because I know that God has done something in my life. And when I begin to walk in that way, when I begin to do what God has called me to do, you can do and say all you want. may sound strange to some and odd to others, but very real in the sense in saying that as you follow God, rest in the Savior, and you move by the Holy Spirit, you will find that sometimes the empire will strike back. Come on now, the empire, any empire in your world, doesn't like to see you function on your own. Empires exist to profit off of you. Empires exist to keep you in your place. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Empires think that they have it together, but, but in their world, they are really insecure about who they are, so they engage, come on now, in petty squabbles, they engage in power plays, they engage in over-under behaviors, and when we engage in behaviors like this, we find ourselves split, separated, and broken. When I begin to play a power play on you and begin to, be, begin to think that it is my position that makes me who I am. split. Yeah. Then we become separated. Then we become broken. Over under behavior. Struggles to get into position or an office rather than positioning myself to be a vessel used by God. Come on now. Some of us we think that because we have a certain title because we have a certain hold a certain office that, that because of that title and because of that office, that we have the supreme power. Yeah. Yeah. And the minute that someone begins to threaten my existence of my power, perceived power, then I'm going to do whatever it is that needs to be done to get you and put you back in your place where you need to be. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Come on now. And then we begin to fail to realize that God is the one who ordains our steps. God is the one that positions us. God is the one that places us and gives us what we need. Now come here. Back to the text. And right here, in the middle of navigating personal and public empires, is a man by the name of Peter who writes with a bold and soothing pen to ease the pain of his fellow sufferers. Peter, the rock of the church, one of Jesus' favorites, the one who knows firsthand about pain and suffering. He writes in that first verse to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who have been chosen you have been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled by his blood. To these exiled people, he says grace and peace is yours in abundance. I don't know about you, but when I'm going through this good, when I'm going through this situation, I'm glad that I have some seasoned saints that understand my situation and can speak to me when I'm going through. And even though I appreciate those who don't know my story, but when I encounter those people that understand and been there, I know what you're going through. I was there once myself. When I have people like this, when I have some Peters in my life, I thank God because they understand me. <laughs> Folks that understand your story, Folks that are able to speak truth and provide valuable insights that help you to navigate your story. And when the empire strikes back at me, hmm? when the empire strikes back at me, it already exists. But the moment that I step out and decide to claim my own freedom, the empire is going to strike back some way, shape, or form. Come on now. You all saw Star Wars. 
Y'all saw the Empire Strikes Back. Star Wars, Luke Skywalker, Han Solo. Come on now, Princess Leia. They destroyed the Death Star. Huh? But three years later, huh? Lucas Films comes out with the Empire Strikes Back. You know that wasn't the end of the story. The Empire was taken down, but I told you earlier that when empires are taken down, empires raise back up with new leaders, new fresh men. Huh? They begin to create structures that will continue to mess with your existence. And that's what the Empire Strikes Back does. That's what happened in that movie. That's what happened in that movie. The Death Star was being built, but Luke and Han Solo, huh? And Princess Leia, they had an operative effort in order to thwart what Darth Vader and Emperor Palpatine was doing. Yeah, huh? You gotta have individuals that are in your place, that understand your situation, that even though we took down the Death Star a few moments ago, Death Star is being raised back up. I need a new fleet of folks that is willing to fight. I need some folks that are willing to stand up and hold up the bloodstained banner of Jesus Christ and be able to fight against empires because empires will strike back. And when empires strike back at me and cause me to shake, cause me to become unsure, what am I to do? Peter encourages me to remember whose I am. Yeah. He encouraged me to ready myself. Yeah. And he encouraged me to renew my mind. Yeah. In remembering whose I am, I am remembering the power of God's saving grace. Yeah. Now, I am remembering that, 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 that the one that looked upon me and created me from the dust of the ground, he said that I am good. Yeah. He said that I am valuable. The salvation that helps me to remember where I came from. It was concerning this salvation that the prophets made careful search and investigation. And they prophesied about this gift which God would give to you. They tried to find out when that time would be and how it would come. But God didn't reveal it to them. This was the time to which Christ's spirit in them was pointing. This time. This time. This time. The thing that you're going through right now.
that God has placed within me. Look at the text. In verse 13, look at the text. It says, therefore, therefore, get your minds right. Prepare yourself for action. Huh? God said, remember who I made you to be. Once you remember who I have created you to be, the therefore shifts me into action to let you know now you need to get in position and get ready for me to blow your socks off. God says, I'm ready to give you what you need. You need to prepare your mind. You need to think deeply about what it is that your faith is trying to do in you and through you. God is talking to you. God is speaking to you. But you decide, I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to do anything. Because God didn't call me to do that. Yes, God did. God did call you to do that. God did call greatness from you. God did put a spirit of love and the power in you. And you can do great things. God wants you to remember. But once you remember, he says, I need you to get ready and renew your minds. In other words, I position myself to deal effectively with the empires in my life. Because I know there are going to be some times when I'm going through and I need to be reminded. Empires seek to diminish, devalue, and destroy those under its thumb. To renew, come on now, to renew means to resume after the interruption. Mosby, I told you in the beginning, in the introduction, I said that we're going someplace. And back in no, back in December 20, 20, uh, 31st, 2014, I said that there's going to be a place that we need to go because there are some places that we need to go to do ministry and we need to keep it moving. Yeah. To renew means to resume after the interruption. You call Christ Davis to be your next pastor. Oh, come on now. To renew means to resume after your interruption. What are the interruptions?
reposition myself in such a way to recognize that God is doing something. Get your mind right. Strengthen the cord with your Savior. Strengthen the cord with your God. Strengthen your cord with the Holy Spirit. And when I move, I'm going to do some great and wonderful things. Renew. Renew means to resume after the interruption. The places that I am, that I'm in right now, can't stay there. The anger, the frustration, the pain, the grief. Sometimes, let me put my therapist hat on. Sometimes, come on. Sometimes you need to connect with the pain. Yes, yes. Someone comes into my office with a traumatic event that they've experienced in their lifetime. Something that they've been through, some form of abuse, whether it's physical, sexual, emotional. You come into my office. One of the first things that I want to ask is where? Where does it hurt? Where is it manifesting itself? Because when you begin to connect with the pain and where it is, then you can begin to understand how you need to deal with it and how you need to go by me coming face to face yeah. with the pain and the anger that I'm going through. When I come face to face, it encourages me and strengthens me and lets me know that each time I decide to face it, each time that I decide to take down a brick, each time that I decide to take down a, a pillar, each time that I decide to take down a piece of the wall, it becomes easier for me to deal with. And sometimes we need to deal with those things in the church. Where is it that you hurt, church? Where is it that your pain is? What is it that you're going through? What is it that you're experiencing? You might look at me and say, I don't got no problems. I don't got no pain. Well, if you're here today, I know you got some problems because God said that trouble don't last always. And if trouble don't last always, that lets me know that you've been in trouble somewhere down the road. So if you don't want to deal with your pain, then maybe, maybe, Connecting with the pain yes. helps me to focus on the wound and then apply the correct remedy. Yes. The appropriate ointment is necessary for a sustained healing. Yes. Huh. I used this particular illustration. When you talk about where you hurt and what what you're what you pain with and what, what you're going through. I remember in Bible study, some may remember, but we were talking about the Good Samaritan. And the Good Samaritan had some ways in which he was providing healing to the individual that was struck down by the wayside. When the Good Samaritan pulled out his oil, he began to anoint. And he began to pull out the oil and, and the alcohol. And he began to pour it on the wound. He began to, to rub in that place that was hurt and that was full of pain. That took me back to when I was a little boy. Even though I had a chest cold and a head cold. It wasn't that I was on life's deathbed. But when mama came in, she pulled out this blue jar <laughs> called Big Sad. <laughs> she opened the top, <laughs> couldn't breathe, couldn't smell nothing, chest felt all tight. Mama began to undo the Big Sad jar. Mama didn't just take a little dab with a cute tip, but Mama dug her whole hand down in the big sack. And excuse me, Deacon Samson, but Mama took the big sack and she put it right there on my chest. 
chest. And she began to, to rub my chest. Only like mama can. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Mama would come in the room. Keep up that big shake. Begin to rub it around. Begin to make you feel like you were new again. That's what God does to us. When you begin to connect with the pain. validation of salvific certification. In other words, I'm saved. Yeah. His grace sustains me. Yeah. God's taking you through so that you will understand him in a deeper way. Yeah. See, some of you are so distressed and dismayed that you feel as though God has forgotten to renew your spiritual contract. But I want you to know that God is not on a contract with you. God has a covenant that he has sealed with you. You are connected to God's own covenant. A contract is a temporary solution where a contract or a con a contract is a temporary solution where a con a con a covenant is a seal is sealed by God's hand. Hmm? God's covenant will give you fresh life again. When we were connected, when we are connected by God's covenant, there is a renewed determination to get back in the race. And that is what Peter was trying to tell those Jewish Christians that were exiled from the Roman Empire. You have been renewed and God is ready to release and rejuvenate you and give you new life. Once you begin to understand where you are, then you understand that you are restored. And Mosby, it's time to get back into the hands of the original owner. Someone else's hands have been on you for far too long that don't know you and don't know how to properly handle the gift that is in you. But when you begin to understand that God has restored you and put you back on the right track, God is going to do new things in you. Mosby, we are going somewhere. The Jewish Christians knew that they were going somewhere. But somebody needed to come along and encourage them and let them know that where you are, what you're doing, it's time for renewal because the interruption is over and I'm going to take you to a new place. God is ready to bless you. God is ready to move in you. And God is ready to take back what the empire tried to take in the first place. Amen. Amen. God is up to something. Thank you. 